Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And uh, welcome back, Ambassador Byerly. We're grateful to have another discussion with you today. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm Alex Carlier from the Middlebury Institute again. And the topic of today's discussion is U.S.-Russia cultural diplomacy from Stalin to Putin and Eisenhower to Biden. So without further ado, Ambassador Byerly, the floor is all yours. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. I, I can't see. I don't have the view set up, but uh, I'll take your word for it that you're all there. Um, thanks for uh, joining just before the start of uh, the holiday weekend. Very glad to be with you again. Uh, and today is a kind of good lead in to uh, uh, the holiday weekend. Uh, we're going to look at soft power. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, the intersection of culture and diplomacy. And I want to start out by taking a look. Add a visual timeline. You can, the timeline's on your screen. It's very, very hard to uh, see. You practically have to get a jeweler's loop to look at it. Uh, but this was done by Alexander Vakru at the Davis Center uh, a couple of years ago. And what they tried to do was quantify the context between America and the Soviet Union and then Russia over the years, starting with the, the beginning of the Cold War in 1948 and going all the way up to, uh, I can't see it on my screen, 2018, I guess. Uh, and there's a legend at the bottom, you know, there's a variety of uh, contact areas here, public health, science, military, arms control, um, and what's interesting about this, you know, it's a sort of imperfect, uh, a very ambitious attempt to quantify this, uh, not scientific uh, at all, although it aspires to be. But what's interesting is really to see the growth of contacts that begins, especially uh, in 1958. Remember that date, because we'll be talking about 1958 uh, a lot today. That's when the cultural agreement was signed. And then the period of detente, they grow a little bit more. And then obviously after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation appears on the scene and there's a huge expansion that coincides with the period we talked about two days ago, Clinton and Yeltsin, uh, even up to the Putin era where it grew and grew and grew, and it grows until 2014, uh, Crimea, and that's where it starts to go down. But uh, my point in showing it to you here is to point out that if you look at this carefully, you see the, the constancy of cultural context between the two countries. Um, although the cultural line is now dwarfed by the enormous increase in things like arms control treaties, scientific exchanges, space cooperation, obviously. Uh, culture in the arts has always played uh, a very special and a constant role, I would say, in helping to shape the perceptions that Americans and Russians have of each other. And I think one reason that US-Russia relations as fraught as they get from time to time have never really broken. I mean, we've never withdrawn ambassadors. We've never stopped diplomatic relations between our countries, uh, despite some very serious disagreements. Uh, one of the reasons that happened is because I think uh, the, the fabric of US-Russia relations uh, is kind of refreshed and uh, enlivened almost sometimes at the very bleakest moments of political confrontation uh, by the bonds and the bridges that are built between Americans and Russians in the arts. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, cultural exchanges have uh, always helped to inform people about the world beyond their borders. You go back to the earliest days of statecraft. Most major nations, starting even in the 19th century, have devoted resources and effort to developing some sort of state-sponsored cultural exchange program. And they've done this for basically two reasons. First, as a means of promoting peace and mutual understanding to try to ensure that that neighbor 
has a, a more rational view of you, which might temper his uh, desire to invade you. Uh, but also, cultural exchange has been used throughout the years as a way to further foreign policy objectives. Uh, now, in the case of the USSR and the United States, of course, the foreign policy aspect of this assumed extraordinary importance in the second half of the 20th century, after World War II, uh, as America and the Soviet Union used the many openings that developed after the end in the post-war period, uh, things like uh, regularization of air travel, ability to get places very quickly, uh, modern communication methods, satellite links, uh, all of that was used both by the Soviets and the Americans to try to gain some advantage in what really became an ideological competition between the two systems. The State Department actually established its first Department of Cultural Relations under President Roosevelt before the war in 1938. And, and by the end of World War II, 1945, there was already in America a pretty vigorous internal debate inside government uh, over which direction the American cultural relations programs should take. Should they be used to kind of implement foreign policy as an extension of foreign policy, or should they just provide a vehicle for the exchange of ideas, the deepening mutual understanding, kind of a laissez-faire approach to, to help the target audience in Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, in this case, to determine their own attitudes, uh, their own desires, their own destiny. So this debate went on through the 1950s. And, and while the, uh, the answer is always obviously a little of both, uh, by the mid 1950s, the prevailing sentiment among officials in the US government was that government should serve as the facilitator of cultural exchanges, not try to manage them. It should basically provide the platform, but not really determine what goes on on that platform. In, in the Soviet Union, obviously, those priorities were completely reversed given the primacy of ideology in, in communist doctrine. Uh, but there was still enough common ground between these two approaches, between the two countries, to allow the two governments, America and the Soviet Union, to reach formal agreement in the late 1950s. Uh, an agreement that officially blessed and promoted the concept of cultural exchange and, and also established some guidelines and some benchmarks for it. This was the landmark 1958 cultural exchange agreement between the US and the USSR. And that agreement, that 58 cultural agreement, I think is a document that contributed as much to lowering the international tension level, the growth of healthier ties between both countries over the past 60 years uh, than any of the arms control treaties that we have also negotiated. And as uh, often happens in our history, uh, it was a shared love of the arts that opened the path to open the path to this agreement. Uh, that shouldn't have been surprising uh, to people who recalled Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky's triumphant tour of the United States. He was the conductor on stage at the grand opening of Carnegie Hall in, 19, in 1891. People who remember that obviously thought that Russia and the United States probably had some cultural ties going back even before the Soviet Union. Uh, people who recognized that a refugee from the Russian empire, a guy named Irving Berlin, had written some of America's best loved patriotic songs, songs that Americans will be singing on July 4th. Uh, probably for many years to come. Uh, but it took more than pragmatism and it took more than a love of music. It, it really took uh, vision and it took political courage for yet another Russian immigrant. There's a trend developing here. Uh, and this is the legendary Saul Hirok, an impresario. Uh, it took his political courage 
to bring the Russian pianist Emil Gilels and the violinist David Oistrakh to New York in 1955. 1955. America in the mid-1950s, uh, the, the anti-communist hysteria of McCarthyism was still hanging in the air a bit. And uh, in Russia in 1955, obviously Stalin had been dead for really just a couple of years. And we were still a full year away from uh, Khrushchev's speech at the 1956 Communist Party Congress that launched the period of de-Stalinization. Uh, so it was uh, a very risky and a complicated business at that particular time for Hurok to arrange for uh, an American production of Porgy and Bess to play in Moscow, but arrange it he did, and it played to packed houses in Moscow. It helped, obviously, that the subject matter of Porgy and Bess dovetailed uh, a lot with uh, the Soviet view of American racial relations, uh, but that was fine. For many Russians, that was the first time they were able to sit in a theater in Russia and watch American performers, American black performers, obviously, in, in, in most cases, Paul Robeson was on that show. So uh, in both of these instances that I've just mentioned, uh, it was the impresarios, it was the cultural artists that took the lead, but the diplomats and the politicians were paying attention. Uh, both in the US and the Soviet Union, they took notice of all of this. And that led directly to the cultural agreement that was signed in 1958. And that cultural agreement uh, provided for exchanges, not just in the cultural field, but in a wide range of, of different fields. From the American side, the agreement was an outgrowth of President Eisenhower. President Eisenhower had a very active interest in encouraging direct people-to-people -people exchanges. And he, in a speech, described the rationale behind that in the following words. He said, if we are going to take advantage of the assumption that all people want peace, then the problem is for people to get together and to leap government to evade governments, to work out not one method, but thousands of methods by which people can gradually learn a little bit more of each other. Dwight David Eisenhower, 34th president of the United States. If necessary to evade governments, who knew that Ike was such a dissident? But he clearly, he was expressing a belief that he thought would not have any negative political consequences for him. In fact, he, in some of the reading I've done, he saw that as a bit of an antidote, as an antidote to what McCarthyism had wrought in America. And he was trying in his way to, to redress this. It was a very clear call to action uh, by Eisenhower. And it was later expressed from a slightly different angle, different perspective by Senator William Fulbright, uh, who created the iconic educational exchange program that still bears his name, the Fulbright program. Some of you may actually have done Fulbrights. Uh, still going strong after six decades. And Fulbright's observation, slightly paraphrased, was this. He said, over the long course of history, having someone who understands how you think buys you a lot more security than another nuclear submarine. Now, Fulbright was once asked, what, what's the ultimate goal of the Fulbright program, of this exchange program that you pioneered? And he answered, to avoid a nuclear war. He said, you might think that's pretentious, but that is its main purpose. So this is where things got started in 1958 with the Russian-American Cultural Exchange Agreement. And at this point, uh, the history becomes a little personal for me in, the, in this timeline, because at least two of the methods that President Eisenhower and Senator Fulbright envisioned set me on the path to my career in the US diplomatic service. Uh, we focus, and we focus quite rightly, I think, on the role that the arts played as an essential component in uh, international understanding. But the 1958 Cultural Exchange Agreement was just as far-sighted 
uh, in its focus on other aspects of private interactions between Soviets and Americans. The agreement expanded and it regularized exchanges of scholars and students, including a program of Russian language and literature study at Leningrad State University for American undergraduates in the 19, starting in the 1970s. I made my first trip to Russia in 1976 on that program to Leningrad. I lived in a Soviet dormitory. I had uh, a Russian roommate. And uh, interestingly, it was the, the Russian roommate who really provided me with my first direct entree to culture in Russia. He, his name was Volodya Ivanov, good Russian name. Uh, he had a part-time job backstage at the Kirov, the Kirov Ballet and Opera Theater called at that time, now again called the Mariinsky Theater. And he would occasionally sneak his American roommates in the back through the stage door uh, on two conditions. We had to dress like Soviets, couldn't wear our Western clothes. And if challenged, we, had, we all spoke a little Russian, we had to pretend that we were from Latvia or Estonia. Uh, but with those two provisos, I got to stand backstage at the Marinsky and watch a number of productions. He, Volodya also had ticket connections. And with his help, I was able to attend many operas, ballets, concerts. I came from a small town in Michigan. You know, I had never been to an opera, never been to a ballet. Uh, this to me was, uh, you know, quite an eye opener. And to be in Leningrad at that same time, uh, for, for really the first time in my life. We arrived in February. And if you've been in Leningrad and St. Petersburg in February and you stay there a few months, you know that things change very quickly. The winter gives way to these long twilights of spring. And I spent a lot of time exploring the canals and, and the courtyards. And I still consider that to be the most, one of the most beautiful cities uh, on the planet. Uh, this was really a life-changing experience for me. Uh, I had gone to Leningrad intending to return home and start work on a graduate degree in Slavic uh, linguistics. I'd actually started uh, in Slavic linguistics at the University of Michigan, but something unexpected happened during those five months that I was in Leningrad. During this semester in the USSR, which was made possible by that 1958 cultural exchange agreement, I came face to face with a lot of paradoxes, the, the paradoxes that basically characterized life in this. Here was a nuclear star uh, that the man in space, built the nuclear arsenal uh, to rival our own, uh, and yet it was still struggling to provide a decent standard of living for its people. I had to stand in long lines, uh, uh, usually in the freezing weather, to buy things like onions or toilet paper. And that gave me a lot of time to think about these paradoxes, to kind of ponder them. I had long arguments with my Russian roommate, with Volodya, in the dormitory, where he would give me the line and tell me why I had it all wrong. Uh, and then once we were outside walking to class, he would tell me he really agreed with me, with the points that I was making. This was uh, the beginning, this was the, my first exposure to the inside versus outside conversations of the Soviet Union. Something very, very puzzling was going on for me, 1976. And so I was determined that I was going to try to solve that puzzle if I could. And that draw me, drew me deeper into a study of Russian history and international relations. I still maintain my interest in, in uh, linguistics and language and literature. But I was somewhere at that point, maybe at the point that some uh, of you find yourselves right now. Uh, and once again, that pragmatic, multifaceted, multifaceted cultural agreement from 1958 provided me with a new opportunity. Under the agreement, the Soviet Union and the United States had committed themselves to exchange traveling exhibitions on diverse cultural, uh, and societal social themes, sports, medicine, agriculture, the role of women, uh, photography, you name it, name a subject. And between 1959 and 1999, 1991, uh, there was probably an exhibition devoted to it, 
showing in a major American or Soviet city. So I worked on two of those traveling exhibitions for three years in the, in the late 1970s. Uh, and I lived for months at a time in almost uh, a dozen different cities across uh, the USSR. I'll show you a picture. Uh, this is me in 1977 in Ufa, uh, demonstrating Polaroid cameras to uh, a very interested group of uh, Ufimsi uh, from, from Ufa. Uh, now these exhibitions that we worked on, all, they always showcased obviously the latest and the best cameras or tractors or hospital equipments that America had to, to show, to display. But the hardware, the cameras, the tractors, that was never the center part of the show. The center of the show by far, the main attraction was, were the 25 American exhibit guides. We were almost all American college students. We were fluent to one degree or another in Russian. We got a lot more fluent as time went on. Uh, and so we demonstrated the displays and we answered the questions for the Soviet visitors who came in. Uh, and these visitors had often waited for over an hour uh, or more to get in. Uh, there were about 20 of these American national exhibitions that toured the Soviet Union starting in 1959 uh, with the famous American exhibit, the US national exhibit that provided the stage for Nixon and Khrushchev to do their famous kitchen debate. Uh, and through this exchange program, exchanging exhibitions. It ran until 1991. We calculated that almost 20 million Soviet citizens were brought into direct personal contact with the United States, with real live Americans who spoke their language. And many of those Russians, many of those Soviets, because we went to many, many different cities, uh, uh, for many years, decades. Uh, over the years, I saw firsthand evidence of this impact. When I was deputy chief of mission at the embassy, deputy ambassador in 2003, when this photo was taken, I, I again visited Ufa, the city where you saw me, uh, saw me demonstrating the camera. Uh, you know, it's an industrial city in the middle of the Urals. Uh, and the head of the American center, the guy on my right uh, in the local university, showed me the brochure that he had brought back from his visit to the exhibit as a kid in 1977. He still had the brochure. Not only did he still have it, but he estimated that that brochure had passed through hundreds of hands in the intervening two decades. Uh, it looked like it, but the US government was, US information agency was smart. We made those brochures out of the thickest paper with the most high grade staples we could find because we knew that they would be passed from hand to hand. That was the idea. Uh, a couple of years after this, when I was ambassador, I went to a conference in uh, Novosibirsk and I sat next to a senior regional leader and we got to talking in the breaks and he said as a teenager, he had visited the exhibition that I worked on in Novosibirsk. 33 years later, he could still describe in unbelievable detail the layout of the exhibition, what was on the stands, conversations that he had had with the guides that he had overheard the guides having with other uh, visitors. Uh, it was really uh, incredible to see the impact that all of this had on 20 million Soviet citizens in those days. And those were just the American exhibitions in the USSR. There were an equal number of Soviet exhibitions, Soviet Wystavki, that toured the United States at the same time. It was a one-for-one -one exchange. And in 1979, I was fortunate enough to accompany a Soviet exhibition, which was devoted to sports, Sovietsky sport. This was just before the 1980 Olympics, which uh, the Soviet Union was going to host. And the exhibition was on a four-city tour going to towns, it didn't go to New York, it didn't go to Los Angeles. It went to Knoxville, Atlanta, Kansas City, and San Antonio. And the crowds were a little bit smaller than you know, the huge crowds that came out to see us, the American exhibition. 
But the reactions of the Americans that I saw who came to the Soviet exhibition and had their first face-to-face -face encounter with the enemy, with a Russian who spoke fluent English, those reactions of those Americans, those were all very, very familiar to me. Uh, none of us, the guides on the American exhibitions, none of us was a career diplomat yet. Uh, we, for the most part, were uh, American college students or some of us language teachers by that point. We were in our 20s and 30s. Uh, but what I learned from those discussions and those debates with Soviet visitors over those three years, six hours a day, six days a week on the stand, arguing, answering questions, getting invitations. Uh, what I learned in cities across the USSR, Rostov, Nadanu, Dushanbe, Kishinyok, Novosibirsk, all of that stayed with me. All of that, without a doubt, made me a much more effective diplomat than I would have been when I joined uh, the Foreign Service in, uh, in 1983. Uh, from, from those discussions, thousands of hours of discussions, I learned a huge amount about Soviet educational system. I learned about their emphasis on the mastery of facts. Many of these people knew European history a lot better than I did. Uh, I learned how Soviet citizens were taught the history of the 20th century. Uh, the centrality of the World War II experience, obviously, how they had been drilled in rhetorical technique. And I learned even more about how Russians think. And that sounds a bit, um, I don't know, almost uh, too ambitious, uh, but uh, I, uh, I got a sense for how Russians, how they construct an argument, uh, how Russian will, uh, respond if you challenge him rhetorically, how they react to, uh, to rude behavior, how they react to a kindness. Many, many of us, many of the guides on those exhibitions went on to careers uh, in diplomacy, in business, journalism, with a special focus on Russia. It was really a unique and uh, I would say supremely effective example of soft power of the power of what we later came to call public diplomacy. And it was obviously a fantastic training ground for us. Uh, over the years, all of these exchanges under the cultural agreement in all spheres, education and science, performing arts, literature, uh, all of them served as a kind of barometer for US Soviet, US Russian ties. When, when relations were good between the two countries, then exchanges would flourish and they would expand. Uh, and when relations were bad, as they often were and are, the programs and the contacts suffered. Remember that timeline, remember 2014, how they start to shrink as the Obama administration pulls back and turns things off following the Russians' annexation of Crimea. But, but they're never entirely extinguished. That's a very important point and another example of kind of this pragmatic streak that pervades uh, relations between Russians uh, and Americans over the years. Uh, even during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962, the New York City Ballet was on tour in the USSR. The New York City Ballet was on tour in the USSR during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And they maintained their schedule of performances. Nothing was canceled, nothing was boycotted, no uh, violence, no threats, no bomb threats. And they played to sold out houses night after night. Again, this is October, 1962, uh, a moment when we were you know, maybe just a few heartbeats away from a nuclear war. And at the very same time, the, the Bolshoi Ballet, Bolshoi, the Bolshoi Ballet, as Americans called it, uh, was on tour in the United States. And not a single performance was canceled or disrupted in the United States as well. So we can walk and chew gum at the same time uh, in this relationship between the two countries. Uh, 1983 to 1985, which were my first two years as a junior diplomat in Moscow, 
Those were two of the chilliest years of the Cold War in US-Soviet relations, hands down. Uh, but the Fulbright scholars continued their studies in both countries. Uh, and I remember vividly the US uh, jazz singer, Broadway star Pearl Bailey came to Moscow and St. Petersburg and Leningrad to perform. And when the Soviet authorities balked at providing an auditorium for her, I mean, things weren't perfect. This was a rough time. She came, but then she had to find a place to actually have a concert. They pulled the hall on her. Uh, that was when we created a concert hall in the ballroom of the ambassador's residence, Spasso House, for really the first time. And she played to a crowd of Soviet fans, standing room only. Soviets who decided that their passion for American jazz outweighed the considerable risk that they were taking in those days of accepting an invitation to come to the American embassy. Uh, and that tradition, the tradition of using the uh, American ambassador's residence, the, the Russian ambassador's residence for events, cultural events as a kind of special showcase, uh, that tradition continues to this day. Uh, it's a real unique, unique and, and kind of delightful intersection of arts and culture. Uh, diplomacy sometimes is a hard slog, but sometimes uh, you get to have a little bit of fun. Uh, this picture is the ice palace that Russian ambassador Sergei Kislyak created in, 19, in uh, 2010, when he transformed his uh, embassy into an ice palace to host the Opera Ball in Washington in 2010. Uh, in, in, back in the 1980s, during my first tour in Moscow, uh, the US ambassador's residence, Spasso House, picture of it here, uh, was the venue for concerts and film showings that, to which we invited Soviet dissidents and refuseniks. If you can believe this, hard for me to believe now in retrospect, but the dissidents and the refuseniks would show up at the uh, guards would let them in. Uh, this was somehow tolerated by the Russians, uh, by the Kremlin and the KGB. And we, in the political section and uh, the ambassador, public affairs, we would talk to them and uh, get some sense of what was happening on the human rights front in the Soviet Union. They usually got hassled or harassed by the security guards, but more often than not, they, they got in. And that is where in 1983, 1984, 1985, especially, we learned a lot firsthand about the real despair, the kind of sense of bisperspectiveness uh, that was beginning to affect uh, not just the dissidents, but also the Soviet power elite that would show up at things like jazz concerts. Uh, so when I returned as ambassador about 20 years later, uh, my wife Jocelyn and I, we didn't need to be asked at all. We continued with great enthusiasm this tradition of using Spasso House as a venue to promote the cultural, scientific, societal links between Russia and the United States. This is a picture of a cultural uh, event, but uh, I hosted the reunion of the Apollo Soyuz astronauts uh, in 2010. We quite often on US Veterans Day, I would invite Soviet veterans from World War II, that, that special connection through my dad. And we would, uh, we would have hundreds of people uh, at Spasso House for that, with a lot of positive press coverage, as you can imagine. Um, so we hosted countless concerts. Concerts were really the main thing. And we hosted lots of them. Uh, but in, in 2010, we staged a special ball to commemorate the 75th anniversary of a famous earlier reception, also hosted in Spasso House, by the first US ambassador to Russia, William Bullock. Uh, this was in 1935. That was a very extravagant evening. Ambassadors were able to spend their own money, had their own money and could spend it in those days. And that ball was attended by Moscow's political and cultural elite, including uh, the writer Mikhail Bulgakov, who was inspired by the spectacle of that reception in the American embassy to create one of the most famous scenes in his masterpiece, The Master and Margarita. So remembering that our embassy 
had played a role somehow in the creation of this uh, masterpiece of literature of the 20th century. Uh, it seemed to us the perfect way to celebrate how diplomacy, history, the arts are all intertwined, how they've all enriched the culture of our two countries and the lives of our people, just to celebrate some good stuff for a change. So with your indulgence and with a little help from Jarla, uh, we'll watch now a short clip from that, 2010.
Great fun. A few words of uh, explanation. Um, when Ambassador Bullitt put the original reception together in 1935, uh, he actually had live animals from the Russian zoo in the ballroom that you saw people dancing. in. Uh, we obviously, I mean, they were in cages or they were on chains or something. Uh, there was actually a bear, a live bear there. Uh, we couldn't do that, uh, obviously, so that's why we had the paper mache. Uh, the jazz band, Bullet, had a jazz band flown in from Prague. Uh, we had Igor Bootman, not, not a bad uh, second uh, choice. But uh, the, the story of that uh, incredible first ball is told in very amusing style in a book that I will recommend to you called memorably Bears in the Caviar by Charles Thayer. Make a note uh, to read that book because you'll hear, uh, you'll read the whole story of the original ball that we were celebrating. You work hard. Sometimes, as I say, you get to have a little bit of fun. Uh, you can spend a lot of time negotiating an arms control treaty. It's a great intellectual, uh, professional challenge, the outcome, vitally important. Uh, but there's not a lot of beauty involved. There's not a lot of style to it. So that's why uh, back a couple of years ago, when I was all uh, queued up to deliver another expose on the international, on the interagency process in Washington, uh, I talked to Anna Borisovna and said, you know, I think five people before me have given this lecture. Uh, what if I just talked a little bit about culture? Thank you, Anna Borisovna, for saying yes. Uh, so that's the intersection from my perspective of cult culture, arts, diplomacy, how it you know, not only builds bridges of understanding, but it also enriches people's lives. Uh, and I think that matters every bit as much as the political relationship between the two governments. And as I said at the beginning, it's also a perfect kickoff to what I hope will be a great weekend for you all. When I was ambassador, uh, the 4th of July reception at Spasso House was by far the biggest reception of the year that we hosted. Thousands of people would show up. And the job of the ambassador is to stand at the head of a receiving line and shake everybody's hand as they come through. And, and uh, I would invariably hear people as they come, came up, shake my hand, say, Sprasnikum gospodin paso. And you have sig signal pichel. And some of them would kind of look at me funny, you know, and I'd say, and they would say, yeah. And I would say, so I say that to you as well. And with that, I'm open for questions or reactions. <laughs>